We began a short study last week. The sermon was called Nature's Praise of God. And we were basically just trying to figure out what does Scripture actually say about the role nature plays in God's grand scheme. And I found it to be an interesting study. I heard from some of you that you did as well. And there's more to that. And so we're going to go on to part two of that tonight and talk about humanity's role in being part of this larger vision God has for nature. So I want to back up a little bit and say that there's a lot of reasons why people might be interested in a study of nature. And if you turn on the television uh, or you listen to the radio or you just kind of see what's going on in the world, you will find that people's reactions to or responses to how do we react or deal with nature is all across the spectrum. And the reasons why are all across the spectrum. And I want to suggest that there are some wrong ways to respond to questions about how do Christians deal with issues of nature. Some wrong ways, for example, are to deify nature. Nature is not God. We're all on the same page on that one. Nature is not God. The line between the creature and the creator is extremely clear. There is a view, there was a view for a long time in a lot of places, called pantheism that said, basically, if you're looking for God, look to nature. Uh, this is a really bad idea because all of nature is in need of the same thing you and I are in need of, and it, we're not going to find the answer if we're only focusing on the problem. We need something transcendent to give us our answer. The creator and the creature, the line is clear. A second problem with how you respond to the question of how to deal with nature, besides deifying nature, is to devalue humanity. Uh, it wasn't that long ago that I was reading an article that said the best thing people can do for the earth is to disappear. They said, we are the worst when it comes to nature. And so let's just quit having kids. Let's go extinct. And that would be the best thing we can do for nature. Uh, that's ridiculous. And it's not just ridiculous. It doesn't fit in with a Christian theology of nature. One of the first things we're going to see is that God has placed humanity at the crown. And there's a reason for that. It's kind of like saying, if some system or business isn't quite going the way it should, let's just get rid of all the people who are making the rules and decisions. It sounds really good at first. The problem is, pretty soon, you know who's running the asylum. Think about this. Deifying nature is not a Christian response. Devaluing humanity is not a Christian response. But the Bible has something to say about what God envisions about nature. I'm not interested in the political discussion at all. I'm interested in what Scripture says about what God had in mind so that we can see through the lens of how God sees. You know, it's interesting how a lot of these small studies are actually an opportunity to catch a glimpse of a spirit that we ought to have in other areas. For example, you do a study of eldership and you have all these uh, kinds of things you look for in an elders. And that's very important. But when you're done, you realize, you know what? I need to be more like that. I'm not an elder, but I need to be more like that in the way I treat other people. You read about marriage. Here's how a husband should treat his wife. Here's how a wife should treat her husband. And you realize, even if you're not married, I need to be more like that. You start realizing that these smaller studies aren't really just about that thing. It's about, here's what it looks like to see through the lens of Christ. Applied in this situation. But you can take those same principles and apply them in others. So last week, we had two basic texts. Genesis 1 and Psalm, uh, Psalm um, 78. Psalm 78 is the one that we sing, let them praises give Jehovah. 
We talked about how it talks about nature has a role to praise God. Fifty times in 25 contexts, nature is told to praise God. In Genesis 1, there is a time in which all that exists is God and nature, and God calls it good. We saw throughout Deuteronomy that God said, when you go in and I want you to follow my teachings to get rid of a people, because if you, these people continue, they will end up teaching things and living in ways that's going to be bad for everybody. And he says, but while you're doing that, make sure you don't mess with the trees. They did nothing to you. Who says that? I'll tell you who. The forester who planted them. In Psalm 104 and verse 30, he says, God breathes new life. He announces to the earth, bring forth grass and behold, it's created. God values nature for nature's sake. God values nature because God loves nature. That's the first thing we learned. God expects nature to praise God. We said, how does that happen? Well, at least one way is by declaring the glory of God. And I talked at the end about some things we ought to be concerned about, careful about. You ever see these sci-fi movies where there is nothing left? And so we're living on other planets or we're living in houses way above the skyline and everything is artificial. The way to breathe is artificial. All the paintings are not paintings of trees because there are no trees to paint. They're paintings of things we've made. And I made the point, imagine, imagine if we reach the point where the only things we have to glorify God are things we've made. So nature has a role to praise God. Tonight, we want to look at what is humanity's role in that story. There are two important but sounds contradictory truths. We need to hear them both and then talk about how we put them together. One is that humans have superiority and dominion over nature. Okay, you know that language from Genesis 1. Be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth. I want you to have dominion over the fish of the sea and the fowl of the air. In Psalm 8, the psalmist brings this out most beautifully. I'd like you to turn there. Read with me. Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens... The works of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you're mindful of him? And the son of man that you care for him. The first four verses is awe and humility. You ever do this? You ever walk out into a night sky and you see one star? And as your eyes start to focus, you see many? And then you span around and you realize there are so many more? And then you get excited, so you go and check your Hubble. Uh, you ch go online and check with Hubble. Or if you can't get online with that, you, you call up the Ralph Wallace and you say, tell me what I need to know. And he tells you how many stars there are. And your mind explodes. It begins with how small we are from our vantage point. But then in verse 5, Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings. And you've crowned him with glory and honor. You've given him dominion over the works of your hands. You've put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O oh Lord, our Lord. How majestic is your name in all the earth. It's a psalm praising God for giving to us, little us, meager us, dominion over all that he's made under the heavens. Crowned us with glory and honor. What is the glory and honor? The answer seems obvious that you and I get to play the role 
towards nature that from their perspective looks like the role of God. Another way of putting it, God is the regent, the king, and he's made us vice regents to rule. But to rule as he rules. Have you thought about the difference between how the kings of the earth rule over people and things and the way that our God rules over people and things? You remember in the Old Testament when the children of Israel told God, we want a king, God ever so politely says, you already have one. I am your king. No, 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 we want a real king. Oh, be careful what you wish for. And the kings of the earth from then until now are imperfect. We mix our own desires. We use people and things to accomplish our will and desires. Augustine once said, love people, use things, not the other way around. But we do. If you were to pick up, for example, Psalm 72 and just read through it about the good king, you know what you find? The good king cares for his subjects. The good king cares for the poor and needy. The good king can be trusted. And the good king makes sure there's grain enough and to spare. The good king makes everything under his rule good. Well, of course that's true. Because in Genesis 1, the good king makes all things and declares it good. Do you see what he's saying? If you want to know how to be a good king, learn what it means to be God. And now I want you, says God, to wear a crown. The crown here is royal language when you take over something. And I want you to have glory and honor, but it's not just your glory and honor. It's the glory and honor that I have because glory and honor is a position, a status. And all of this is under your dominion. All things under your feet. What are you going to do with that? So the first story is dominion. This is the one where you ask the question, do I have the right? Do I have the power? Do I have the ability to use everyone and everything for my purpose and my advantage? And the answer is yes. But you remember that great important line from that extremely important theological movie, Jurassic Park? We spent all of our time thinking about if we could. We never stopped to ask if we should. We have dominion. But then we go to Psalm 104. Turn over there with me. And Psalm 104 presents the other side of the coin, both of which are presented in Genesis 1. Remember, Genesis 1 says you are to have dominion. There's a hierarchy, and you humans are at the top of the creation. But it's also interesting that he doesn't give humans their own day. Have you seen that? In Genesis, God doesn't give humans their own day. There's a reason. I want you to recognize what you have in common with the creation. It doesn't even give them their own unique name at first. They're living beings. So are all the animals. They have the breath of life. Genesis 6 and 7, so do all the animals. They're going to return to dust. So will all the animals. There is a hierarchy and there's an equality. Look at Psalm 104. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with a garment, stretching out the heavens like a tent. He lays the beams of his chambers on the waters. He makes the clouds his chariot. He rides on the wings of the wind. He makes his messengers winds, his ministers a flaming fire. He sets the earth on its foundations. 
You cover it with the deep as with a garment. The water stood above the mountains. At your rebuke, they fled. At the sound of your thunder, they took to flight. Verse 10, you make the springs gush forth in the valleys. They flow between the hills. They give drink to every beast of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. Beside them, the birds of the heavens dwell. They sing among the branches. Verse 14, you cause the grass to grow for the livestock and plants so man can cultivate. That he may bring forth fruit from the earth and wine to gladden the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, bread to strengthen man's heart. The trees of the Lord are watered abundantly, the cedars of Lebanon that he planted. In them the birds build their nests. The stork has her home in the fir trees. The high mountains are for the wild goats. The rocks are a refuge for the rock badgers. He makes the moon to mark the seasons. The sun knows it's time for the setting. Read through the chapter. In verse 31, he says, May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. And yet, humans are almost an afterthought in the chapter. Don't misunderstand. We've already announced humans are not an afterthought. Psalm 8 makes that clear. But a whole psalm about how God's glory is seen in the world and humans barely get mentioned. It's a second truth. There is hierarchy. And there's a sense of relatability. When Jesus comes to earth, he becomes incarnate. He's fully God and he's fully human. Which means in a way that's hard to explain, in a way I don't fully understand, there is clear hierarchy and there's equality. When he rises from the dead, the Bible says he rose so that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. It, it feels almost sacrilegious to call Jesus our brother, but you better get used to it because he calls us his brother. Think about that. So much so that when he comes back a second time, the Bible says, we don't know yet. We don't know yet what we shall be, but we know this. We shall be like him. Like him. How do we know we'll be like him? Because he was willing to be like us. Hierarchy. And in some sense, I don't understand quality. And so Jesus becomes the perfect example to teach us how to react to the world. And what do you see in the Gospels in how Jesus reacts to nature? The first place I want to go may seem like an unlikely place to go. It's Mark 1 in verse 13. I want to remind you, Mark is my favorite Gospel. It's the shortest. When 90% of what's in Mark is reproduced in Matthew and Luke, it makes that 10% really interesting. That 10% that only Mark gives, this is one of those. If, if somebody said to you, what's the story of Jesus and the temptation? You probably know it. You know that Matthew and Luke both tell the story of Jesus facing three temptations. They both devote 12 verses to it. Did you know that Mark has a temptation story? It's only one verse. And you would think if it's only one verse, it must truncate what's said in the other ones in a way that doesn't carry anything over. But that's not true. In that one verse, Mark 1, 13, he includes two lines that are not in the others. Interesting. Here's the line that I want you to focus on. And he was with the wild beasts. It seems like a throwaway line. Oh, okay, he's just painting a picture. He's out there in a desert, arid place. There's animals roaming around. He's just trying to tell you that he was out there in a, in a, in a, in a place where there aren't any people, just animals. That's all he's trying to say. Mm. If you've got these other stories, 12 verses long to tell, and you truncate it and throw in a line that nobody else uses, it seems to me you might be trying to make a point. 
It turns out the word with, which I spent all morning talking about, I left this line out on purpose, with could give you the impression when you first read it of something scary. If I was telling a bedtime story to Grace and I said, everybody was gone and there was this man and he's with all the wild animals, she'd probably think, ooh, that's scary. But it turns out the word with in the gospel of Mark almost always, I want to say always, but I'm afraid somebody is going to find one verse that doesn't fit this pattern. Almost always, with in the gospel of Mark is friendly association. It turns out that there were writings between Malachi and Matthew. And those writings is where the Jewish people are planning ahead, thinking ahead, taking statements they see in the prophets, combining it with their own wisdom about what they're expecting. It's not in your Bible, but it's in the minds of the people who are listening to Jesus. It's the bedtime stories people were reading at night. It was in the culture. Jesus is aware of this. He borrows from this stuff sometimes in some of his parables. And in those stories, they talked about Adam in the garden as the prototype, that when the Messiah comes, he will be like Adam in the garden. In fact, they get the idea from Hosea chapter 2 and verse 18, where God says, in that future day when I establish a new covenant, I will establish that covenant with the birds of the air and the wild animals, and they shall lie down in safety. Isaiah says the wolf will lie down with the lamb. And this is how you'll know that all are at peace in my holy mountain. It's why I think the message translates this right. The message says, and the animals were his companions. He's representing the new Adam at peace with the world. Keep looking through the Gospels. He reimagines what it's like to be true humanity, Psalm 8, crowned with glory and honor with everything under his feet. And then he imagines what would it look like to serve humanity and serve nature the way God did in Genesis 1. And in Genesis 1, God brings order out of chaos. So what does he do? Does Jesus predominantly stir up the waters or does he calm them? Does God predominantly bring death and destruction or does he bring healing? Does, does Jesus in the gospels predominantly give plagues or restore healing? What's he doing? He's announcing this is what it looks like to be God's vice regent in which everything under your feet gets better. Because we're seeing through the lens of a God who has power over, but never treats that as if that's how the relationship should always be seen. In fact, he tells us, don't be like the kings of the earth. They think that if you're in charge, it means you have power over. But it shall not be so among you. Where does he get this idea? He gets it from his father, who surrenders the life of his son to rescue humanity. And then you get this language in Romans 8 or in Revelation 21, which I don't have time to go into. It gives the impression that maybe even at the end of time, it'll be something like what we see in the Gospels. God made a good world in Genesis 1. Sin entered the world and the effects made it bad. And in the Gospels, Jesus comes into those situations where the effects have made it bad. He removes the effects. And what you're left with is something good. You have a good human being who's been possessed by the demons. He rids them of demons, and what you're left with is a good human being. 
You have the seas that are storming everywhere, and he calms the seas. What you're left with is a calm sea. And you have this language in Romans 8 that says, the whole creation is groaning and travailing in birth pains, waiting for its liberation when the sons of God are declared, which seems to sound like God is going to, in some way that we can't fully understand, make right all that's been made wrong by us. Do you realize in the Gospels, every single thing in nature responds to Jesus except one? Even the demons respond to Jesus. The winds and the waves obey him. The sickness stops. The demons leave. Who's the only part of creation that rejects him? It's us. And this is Genesis 3. That human sin, human sin will affect creation. I want to remind you again of the line. You're welcome to come on in. I want to remind you again of the line in Genesis 3. The serpent has messed up. The serpent has beguiled Eve. And so God says, curse their serpents. Eve has messed up. And so he says, here's the curse on women. Adam has messed up, and you expect the line to be, here's the curse on men. But there isn't one. And before you think, well, that's not fair, oh, it's worse. Do you remember? Serpent, because of what you did, here's the curse on all serpents. Eve, for what you did, here's the curse on all women. Adam, for what you did, here's the curse on the ground. Human sin will have effects that will be seen all over creation. And when true human, true Adam came, he began to show us what it looks like to reverse the curse. Here's our task between now and when he comes back. To live in such a way that all that is under our dominion reflects the glory of God and is better because God's put us in charge. Let's pray. God, we love you. We ask you to give us wisdom and understanding. Teach us your ways so we might be a good king. Father, remind us of your love. Thank you for making us so special, giving us the image of God, declaring us as those who are going to have a future with you forever. And Father, may we wear that with humility. And may the whole world be blessed because you have crowned us with glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, y'all, Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I put my hope in your holy word. I put my hope in your holy word.